we're looking at uh, the life cycle of a church under the title of Grow. Um, the idea really is that we think through the life cycle of a church so we can uh, work out where we are in a process and so we can think of uh, how we might want to take the next steps that are useful uh, for uh, our church plant. The key verse for the whole of the grow section, which is going to be the first section in each of our days, is Acts 9.31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. And essentially what we have in Acts is what Jesus continues to do and to teach. If you remember that uh, emblematic opening sentence of Acts chapter 1, in my former book, Theophilus, I told you what Jesus began to do and teach. And therefore, the implication is that in the book of Acts, uh, Luke is going to tell us what Jesus continues to do and teach. So Jesus is alive. He is risen. He has ascended. He is reigning. He is going to pour out his spirit, as Acts 1, 8 will tell us. And through the spirit, by the, Holy, uh, by the apostles, Jesus will continue both to do and to teach. Uh, it's, it's Jesus who's still at work in the book of Acts. He is not on leave. He, he's not been confined to heaven. Um, he is active by the Spirit through the apostles and through the church. And essentially what the apostles do in the book of Acts is they preach the gospel and plant churches. And those two things go hand in hand. The preaching of the gospel is uh, with the aim of the planting of churches. And the planting of churches uh, multiplies the preaching of the gospel everywhere it happens. And so we have this theme throughout the whole of Acts where the church and the gospel grow and expand, um, both in terms of numbers uh, in any local place, in terms of depth, as people understand the gospel more and more, and in terms of geographical reach. And, and so the whole of the Mediterranean basin is uh, filled with gospel-centred churches as a result of this mission. And this verse in Acts 9.31 is one of those verses that summarise that for us. The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and, and you can see that, that geographical expansion uh, happening, and it's going to go to the ends of the earth, as we know, according to Acts 1.8. Um, it's living in peace, and it's being built up. And it is multiplying as it walks in fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. In other words, uh, what we're trying to say in this uh, session and in these four session, sessions of grow and advanced church planting is what are we aiming at as we plant a church? Uh, because many people aim at something that is substandard, that is to say the establishment of one local church uh, that might have uh, perhaps a building in mind that would be 100 people big or 150 people big depending on your context and as soon as you get to the size of that building being filled up your mission is over and now you just keep going until Jesus returns, and that is a success. And that is not the mindset that we think we see in Acts. The mindset that we see in Acts is that the church plant never stops aiming at multiplication. The church plant never stops aiming at multiplication. Uh, and just as uh, Christians multiply Christians and disciples multiply disciples and leaders multiply leaders so churches multiply churches. Uh, there are meant to be more and more church plants happening all around the world all the time and if I plant a church I can't be satisfied if that church gets planted and survives. Satisfaction doesn't lie there. Satisfaction is to do with the expansion of God's kingdom through that church aggressively pursuing expansion locally, regionally, nationally, internationally, uh, until the whole world is filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so it's possible as a church planter to have too little ambition. Um, many people in the introduction mentioned Acts 29. This is not an Acts 29 session, it's a European Leadership Forum session. Um, but one of the things that we say in Acts 29, and I'm the Europe Director of Acts 29, as you'll have known from my bio, um, one of the things that we say is that we want to be a uh, diverse global family of church planting churches. That is to say that our church plants from the beginning aim at planting more churches. We don't aim to get to a certain level, we aim to keep on planting churches. And in order to have a really clear idea of that, it, it might be useful just to think to ourselves, what is the life cycle of any 
given local church. Some of these things are very much biblical and some of them are just creation wisdom. Some of them are just experience. And I don't have a problem drawing from all of those streams of truth. Uh, there's truth, obviously, in the Bible and there's things there that we must do. Um, but there's also things from wisdom and from creation that we can just know uh, and we can, we can share those things without insisting that people agree with us on every aspect. So what is the life cycle of a local church? How could we describe it? And essentially what we've done is we've taken uh, the idea of uh, birth of a child uh, and followed that metaphor through to describe what it might be like to plant or to have a church be born in any uh, given context. And so first part is gestation. Uh, this is the part where somebody starts dreaming about a church being planted in any given location. Uh, this is the part where people are looking at, perhaps at a map uh, and you have to believe that Paul looked at maps. Uh, I think Paul definitely looked at maps. Uh, why I say that? Because if you remember uh, in Romans chapter 15 and 16, uh, Paul says he wants to go to Spain because he's no more work to do in these regions. Um, why Spain? Well, if you were to look at a map, uh, and I might show you this map later on, if you were to look at a map that Paul might have been able to see at those uh, in those days, what essentially you had was you had a, a square like this, uh, and you had Asia over here, uh, and uh, Jerusalem, and you had Africa down here, and you had Europe up here, and then right at the ends of the earth, right in the corner, all squished up against the side, you had Hispania or Spain. Uh, and so as Paul would have got out his map of the day, and uh, when he was poring over the, the kind of the geography of the uh, early church, and as he listened to Jesus' words, uh, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth um, that we have in Matthew 28, but also uh, in Acts 28, he had been saying the ends of the earth, looking at the map, that's Spain. I want to go right to Spain <laughs> to get there to plant a church. So anyway, th this idea of gestation, this idea of dreaming, this idea of planning out a church plant uh, based on what you know of any given situation and its gospel needs, um, that is the, the first part of it. And some of you might even be there. I was listening to both Michael and um, uh, Janitza. I can't, I'm going to not be able to say your name now. Is that right? Um, and you guys are in that period of gestation of a church plant. And you're beginning to think and dream. What would it be like to have a group of God's people meet and witness and serve in this locality? And it's a great, exciting time where you're trying to think it all through. Uh, you're trying to find out who's going to be part of your team. That's also where one of you is. I remember the guy in, in, in John in Berlin looking for people to join his team. Uh, you're, you're trying to raise perhaps funds. You're paying, perhaps trying to give up one job and, and free up some money to, to do another thing. You're trying to look at the human resources, the material resources, um, everything that you might need to put into operation in order to get a church started in any given location. You're maybe going to move to that area. You're maybe going to start looking around. And you're going to be saying, OK, this is what this people is like. This is what they like to do. This is when they like to do it. This would be a good time for a church service. This would be a bad time for a church service. This is how they uh, meet together. This is how they greet one another. These are the kinds of things that are important to them. And um, all that kind of stuff goes into the gestation as you look around and do that really important work of contextualization, of cultural exegesis. All that kind of stuff goes into that gestation. Um, you're going to be talking to local authorities, you're going to be talking to other local churches if there are any, um, you're going to be asking them what you should and shouldn't do and then making decisions on, on the basis of that. All that gestation stuff that can take 12 to 24 months to do, you'll be doing that uh, in the local area and praying to God, praying that he will uh, allow you to plant a church in that area. And then having done that uh, really important work beforehand, at some point, you will start to gather as a church, and we might call that uh, the birth. Now, this can be very progressive or can be quite uh, one shot. Uh, let me just tell you some of the experiences I've had in terms of how we've planted churches in and around the Paris area. Um, one uh, church that we planted in Châtelet in Connexion, um, if you want to look that up, you can look up. Uh, I'll put a, a link in the chat for that. Uh, we sent a uh, a trained church planter with his wife and essentially there's a very small group of people that were gathering I think there were five or six of them uh, right in the center of Paris uh, and we sent them full-time to plant the church uh, and they 
started with uh, a church service and with a home group at the same time. And they built in very quickly all kinds of uh, community-based meals and uh, community-based fellowship. And they're right in the middle of Paris, the right at a hub of uh, where transport lines cross. And quite quickly that church grew through their intentional uh, discipleship-based, uh, community-based approach to preaching the gospel and the gospel out. Um, and now the church has 160 or 170 people, uh, and that was one model that we did. So right from word go, they were meeting publicly and they were doing uh, smaller groups. Other models that we've done um, have involved people being um, bivocational or co-vocational, uh, as people now talk about. Just on a, on a side note, the difference between bivocational and co-vocational, bivocational is more or less you have to work in order to earn money, but what you really want to do is be gospel a gospel worker. Co-vocational is when you consider both of the things that you do, both the secular and the gospel working element, to be equally important, and you can't imagine one without the other. And so, in fact, your secular employment provides you with all the links and the context to do the gospel work that you want to do. Uh, but we've had those people, both um, bivocational and co-vocational people, team together to plant churches. Um, and we, they start off with a small group, which is more or less the, the, the core group of people that they want to plant the church with. And they spend time building into that person's life in the core group. And they build the values and the vision and they get those embedded into people. And then once those visions and values and uh, community habits are built into the core group, then they move from that core group um, via mission into public services. So there's all kinds of models of how you're going to manage the birth. But the birth is the moment when the church community becomes public uh, and becomes uh, the, uh, the visible outpost of the kingdom of God in that locality. Uh, and as I said, there's, there's many ways of going about that. There might be a new mobility for evangelism. There might be a new focus on growth. Um, you might start training leaders or thinking about training leaders. Uh, you might start structuring for different things in, in this kind of whole um, part. Um, once that has happened, it's it's very exciting uh, and it's, a, it's an amazing time of any church plant uh, to get out there and to start having worship services and to start having that public presence. Um, but you'll want to stabilise and you want to start to plan for the future um, uh, at some point, and that might be called uh, childhood. So you've got a certain level of people who are coming to your church. Um, you're starting to look ahead, not just to the next six months, but to the next two or three years. Um, you start adding in things that will help different people grow in different ways. Um, you're starting to organise things uh, from the point of view of the Bible's uh, structuration. Uh, so you might add deacons and you might add elders or be thinking about adding those uh, as you go through. Uh, at some point, and we'll be talking about this more this afternoon, uh, you're going to see people who come into the church as brand new believers, uh, growing as believers uh, and coming into some sense of leadership in the church. And that might be what you might call the adolescence of the church. Uh, the, the, you start to have a bigger sense of responsibility for yourself. Perhaps during gestation, birth and childhood, you're very much supported from outside. And so the money that's coming in is coming from outside and from missionary support, from all kinds of other support. And then when you hit this kind of adolescent stage, you're beginning to be able to think about being financially independent. And those um, gifts start growing a bit more um, and you start being able to imagine uh, the future more serenely. Maybe you, you want to add uh, more people who are working full-time for the church or part-time for the church. Uh, those are the kinds of things that you're thinking about in this adolescence uh, stage. Uh, and all of this is, is aiming towards a mature church. A mature church that has elders, a plural a number of elders, that has deacons that are serving, uh, that has a stable and growing uh, number of people coming along on a Sunday, and that those people are also uh, feeding into the smaller groups that you have. Um, the giving is regular uh, and focused. <coughs> uh, you're able to imagine moving forward. You might even have the ability to buy a building of your own or to rent uh, facilities 
that make your mission uh, easier and more obvious um, and more public. And many people stop their idea of church planting at that point. Got a pastor, tick. Got elders, tick. Deacons, tick. Building, tick. Finances are going well, tick. Uh, and that's where you stop. But this is the key point because it's very easy to slide into some kind of um, laziness or self-satisfaction at this point. And this is the very point where we need to have a vision for continuing church planting beyond this point. And so the next point uh, that we want to talk about is reproduction. Uh, in a sense, it is very natural to talk about this at this point. Uh, you'd be very disappointed if you're a parent, if your children grew to adolescence and stopped there, or even grew to adulthood and stopped there. Um, what, what we're really wanting, I think, as parents is for our children to grow up and then to have a sense of responsibility, not just for themselves, but for the wider community, such that they get married, have children and start to build out um, in a kind of generational way uh, for the future. Uh, and this is what we're looking to see as well in terms of churches. We want to see churches reproduce. We want to see churches move towards the multiplication of other local churches, uh, as we see in Acts 9.31. How do you make sure that when you get to maturity, the next stage will be reproduction? And that you won't just get lots of people satisfied with what they've got that are happy to keep the church going as it is. But I think the way in which you want to do that is make sure that you build in right from the start, right from the word go, right at this point in gestation, the vision for being a church planting church. Uh, the, the key factor about people wanting to get on board for more church planting is enthusing them from the beginning that this church plant is never going to be an end in itself. I remember vividly one time we were planting a church in uh, the church where our pastor valed up uh, and one of the people in the one of the smaller groups in that church was praying at the end of a small group whether or not she was a Christian at that point or just becoming a Christian uh, I'm not quite sure at any rate she was on a path to conversion and I remember her prayer vividly because she was praying and she said uh, that she thanked the Lord for this church and for the church that was planting this church and for the other church that we were planting at the same time. So that was Len Yveld up and Shell. And uh, she said, and, and we want to pray, God, that you will help us plant churches everywhere in the whole of the Paris area where there is no church. Because she had understood right from the beginning, from the vision that we cast, that church planting wasn't something that replied just to Val up, but church planting was something that applied to all of the towns in saint marne and in the Val d'Europe area and in Ile-de-France where there weren't churches. Uh, and she'd got that vision from us and she was praying to God whether or not she was a Christian at that point for more church plants all over the place. Uh, and so you see you can't afford to wait until you get to maturity to start asking people to think about church planting. And so particularly those guys who are a few who are thinking about gathering a core group or launching a service in the next 12 months Please build in right at this point, at the gestation point, we are going to be a church planting church. One of the ways that we encourage people to do this in Acts 29 is to give aside 9% of their income or 10% of their income right from the beginning to a new church plant. Now that doesn't include the giving that comes from outside of the church. So imagine you're giving big gifts from another church either within the country or from outside your country. We're not asking you to tie that gift which is given for your church plant. What we're saying is that the people who start giving in your church plant, the interior giving, what we're saying is get them to give 10% of what they give for another church plant. Put it as a line in the budget. Put it in your vision statement. Say we want to be a church planting church and one of the ways we're going to do that is we're going to give 10% of all internal giving every year in our church to a new church plant. And that might only be 100 euros or 50 euros in the first five years of your church plant. Who cares? The important thing is not the amount, it's the principle. And as your people see you give money to new church plants, they will understand that it really is important and that the mission that you have is not a mission that is just selfish for the geography that you're going for, but it really has this global vision that God has for his glory filling the earth as the waters cover the sea. And so if you want at point six to be reproducing, you have to, at point one, build in the idea that you're going to be doing that. 
and talk about it all the way through. Uh, put it in the, in the budget and, and aim for it intentionally. And so as you reproduce, and we're going to be talking about this as well in the session called Steps, <clears throat> what you want to be doing is, uh, because you're training leaders um, in all these previous sections, childhood, adolescence and maturity, because as, as people come in to faith and as they're growing as disciples, what you're wanting to do is train up future gospel workers, whether they be local elders or church planters or other church pastors or gospel workers of any description. In order to be able to reproduce and to be a real motor in reproduction, you've got to be producing the leaders and the church planting team members that will be able to be sent out from your local church. In Europe, this is so key. Uh, we must be aiming to train up the best people in our assemblies to send them out to plant new churches. And this has been the DNA of our church right from the start. And of course, there's many models of doing that reproduction phase. Um, I've just told you about a couple that we did. We trained a couple and sent them into Centre of Paris, not with a team of people from us, but just to do it. Uh, other uh, models that we've done are, are sending a team from a church, uh, more like a church plant, uh, from a mother church to another church. But whatever you're doing, building it in and training leaders are two key um, factors in that. Uh, we're aiming to be reproducing not just once, but multiple times. Um, aiming for third generation reproduction, i.e. not to be satisfied having planted one church, but collaborating with that church plant to plant more churches. Uh, that is a beautiful thing. Um, just as a, 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 to be honest about this, uh, we tried to do this with our Valdevop church. So Lanyi Church, which was the church where I was initially a pastor, planted Valdevop Church about 15 minutes away um, and then we were trying to get together to plant uh, another church in Ch in Villeparisi um, and that church hasn't really succeeded yet uh, because the person we sent is full-time and also doesn't have a team with him and so we've been battling against that. Uh, we're aiming for it but we haven't yet got there uh, so this is not all uh, a success story about how brilliant it, it is to, to plant churches, it's difficult and costly what we're aiming to do is to keep a church planting vision uh, going with all the churches that plant or are planted uh, within our little uh, local network. But you see the thing is, and this is the key uh, takeaway for people who aren't convinced up to this point, uh, the alternative to planting and planting and planting again, uh, keeping an eye on the growth of the gospel, um, keeping an eye on what the Spirit is doing today in the world through his people and through his church is essentially plateau decline in death. And, and we see this uh, in both the Bible and in real life. Churches that forget mission often find themselves racked in internal squabbling, division, um, plateauing and then decline in death. Indeed, it could be argued that in terms of the seven letters that Jesus writes uh, in Revelation to the church, that the main thing that he is uh, um, criticising them for is the fact that they've lost their focus on mission because they've lost their love for him. If you look at the first and the last letters, that's essentially the mission statement um, of, of those letters. You've lost your love for me and therefore you've forgotten to witness. You're not shining like a candlestick anymore. And so if that happens, um, either Jesus will come and remove the candlestick, the letter to Ephesians, or he'll spit them out of the mouth, letter to Laodicea. In other words, Jesus wants his church to be on mission. Um, and so we don't want to be a church that withdraws from mission and therefore enters into this plateau and decline pattern that we've seen so many times. And even in a continent like Europe, which has so few churches in terms of its penetration, uh, and in terms of its context, we do see many churches that are in this death, plateau and decline pattern. That unless something dramatic happens quite soon, that these churches will lose their effectiveness and they'll wither and die. And that's why one of the tracks on this whole uh, Europe Leadership Forum is revitalization of churches. It's possible to get into a church and to operate a, a revitalization, a resurrection, if you like, um, 
it's possible for the leaders to call on people and say we need help please come and help us do this uh, but it's hard it's difficult and wouldn't it be great if we could avoid that stage in the churches that we're responsible for if we could avoid that in the churches that we'll plant by keeping the eye on mission and by keeping the eye on reproduction and by keeping the eye on being churches that plant churches that plant churches and so multiply themselves uh, and don't get to this stage of death uh, via plateau and decline.